that in somebody's case. But especially the fact that they are an underrepresented minority meant they had to climb much higher hurdles. They had to work much harder to get to the place where, uh, the, where other people just feel entitled to be. And that idea of, oh, you know, you're lucky to be a person of color in academia because universities are dying to fill their quotas. Well, they're dying to fill their quotas because they're 20%, for instance, uh, close to 20%, I think 17% uh, black people in the US, but how many faculty are black? Nowhere near. So that doesn't mean that it's easier to get a faculty position when you're black. It's way harder. If it were easier, our faculties would be full of black people. Uh, but they're not. So it's, it, it's a, a kind of double aggression, um, both because of the vulnerability that we all have and because it's just blatantly untrue. Mina, do you want to? Uh... Yes, I, um, uh, I wanted to also highlight the, this rather pernicious, um, seemingly innocent microaggression that's also quite common is when people compliment you on your skills uh, for example, wow, you're so well-spoken or your writing is surprisingly good. And the question now, you know, anyone wants to follow up with when they receive that kind of feedback is relative to what expectation? Where is this prediction error coming from, <laughs> right? Um, and what people are doing is that they're, what they're revealing is, is their biased priors. And what that does is it communicates you know, a lowered bar of expectation for the scholar. And we know from research that there is a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, at least in early education, that we need to be really careful about, right? That these priors inform how teachers teach, um, how advisors advise, to what extent mentors actually invest in their mentees because they have lowered expectations. And that's an extremely problematic orientation to have. Um, but, but what people don't understand is that in paying that compliment that they're revealing they have that prior. So before you pay what you perceive to be a compliment about how surprised you are with regard to this, think about where it is that that expectation you had came from in the first place and why you felt compelled to, to give that compliment. Now, if it's something that you tend to give that kind of feedback to everybody, um, you know, there are other ways to give that feedback that don't come across as surprise. <laughs> you know, you can say, you can give feedback that's positive, but that it's not, um, it doesn't speak to it being a violation of your expectation. Okay, um, I have another one highlighted here. Uh, I, highlighted, I highlighted it. Uh, PIs of color, especially Black PIs, being casually asked, whose lab are you in? Uh, I think that that is very common. It's also postdocs being asked, you know, um, uh, when did you, you know, when are you graduating? Uh, graduate students, um, what happened? My I access has expired. Okay. Okay. Loaded. Um, this is also, I marked it one because it happens many times and two because it's really easy to fix always assume that everybody has a doctorate and that everybody is a PI. You know, you answer people's emails. I answer everybody with Dr. So-and-so. I'm not going to ask, you know, are you the administrator or are you whatever? It's just, just assume that everybody is, is, um, that ev everybody has already gone through the system and is not a, a, a trainee. Uh, it, not that there's any shame in being a trainee, but if you if you assume over, then people will just will correct you and say, no, I'm, you know, I'm still in so-and-so's lab. Um, there's a, another one in here that I think is really important to talk about that has a fairly reasonable uh, solution, in part because it comes from a place of just not noticing. Um, I think that people don't realize who is speaking up in their lab meetings, in their faculty meetings, in their seminars. And uh, one way to just make that a little bit more explicit is to actually keep track. So I remember I have the, the recollection of being in a faculty meeting it was for an interdisciplinary center and unbeknownst to everybody in the room, 
someone started tallying the number of times that, you know, male versus female faculty were speaking. And I mean, we can do this along any demographic boundary. And it was really remarkable because even in a room that was supposed to be dedicated to um, understanding inequality, you saw this inequality on, along gender lines in that particular case being recapitulated in the very conversation about inequality. And so it might be worth trying to keep track of that. And then sharing that information with people either in your lab or in your department, if it's at the seminar level um, or in your area, if it's a brown bag event, because it, people might be really surprised by the numbers that are revealed there. And, and then another possibility is that you can make space. So for example, I know many of departments do a really good job of prioritizing, for example, trainees questions first. So when you have a guest speaker before any of the faculty are allowed to ask questions, they require that some of the trainees ask questions to get the conversation kicked off. And I think that implementing practices like these can actually help address a lot of these issues pretty readily. Um, a lot of people are asking where the link to the Google Doc is. We're not making that public now. We can make it public later, but I think with Zoom, Zoom bombing and everything, we do not want to make that public. So oh, I actually did. I think we just did. Yeah, oh, you I did? did? It's after, but it's view only. Uh, after removing editing exits. Okay, view only. Yeah, it's view only. Uh, that's why I lost access. Um, <laughs> okay, I wanted to, to uh, continue on Mina's point. Um, if you are leading a group, um, whether it's you know a small group in, in a class uh, that you're TAing, for instance, or you're uh, the head of a lab, or uh, the head of the, you know leading a group that's doing some research, um, if you suspect that you have this tendency to misrepresent who had ideas, to misremember who had an idea. Uh, who, who, um, so this comes with interrupting. So part of it is being interrupted and part of it is because of the expectation, uh, the implicit expectation that the good ideas come from X and not from Y for all kinds of reasons, we tend to then attribute, misattribute the idea to X and not to Y. So that's another point where you might wanna just take notes uh, of what people wrote. And I know of examples of people saying, uh, people in industry saying, once I started writing, I realized who in my, like some people in my team, I never heard that they were saying these ideas and, and they were. So um, that's continuing that thread. Uh, we, um, I yeah. wonder if like for, for like, if you watch, I know we're not in the what bystander, what to do if this happens, but like um, since there's so many other things, so if we don't forget like what will be an appropriate response if you see someone get interrupted. Can we let them finish? Like, I, I feel like that's, one thing I've used and it doesn't seem to offend any, anybody. Also, I'd like to hear what they're saying. No, I'd, I'd like to yeah. hear the end of that thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, failures is allies. So not proactively recruiting underrepresented minorities, not proactively supporting underrepresented minorities who are already in the lab or the department. This is especially on us as faculty um, one thing that I wanted that I added to that here in parentheses uh, that I read on the black in uh, in the ivory thread is this idea that then when they do succeed, we say, look at how great our program is or what a great mentor I am. This person is so successful, basically taking credit for um, someone else's excellence, which we should never do, but also for the opposite of what we did if we did not support them, if we even made it harder for them. And then when they do succeed, despite the odds, we congratulate ourselves and pat ourselves on the back. I can't imagine how hurtful that is for the person who has struggled um, and, and felt um, abandoned in the whole process. And then their glory is basically taken away from them. And reading that really kind of shocked me. I, I'd never thought of that. And I was thinking, you know, have I ever done that? Do, do, you know, it's just something that I, I really want to keep in mind moving forward. Um, am I taking credit for other people's success, period? Um, and especially um, underrepresented minorities who their successes are, only, are, are their own. They have had to work so hard to do what for many of us is just simple, not because it's harder for them to do, it's because the system just blocks them at every point. So to get to the same exact achievement, they just have to run, you know, twice the marathon. Yeah, and there's a lot of other responsibilities to get laid 
in at the at the feet of our underrepresented minoritized scholars that don't necessarily so for example if there are other urm scholars in the department who are seeking support they will often tend to go disproportionately to other urm scholars so they're doing a lot of the mentoring they're doing a lot of the emotional labor um, whereas other scholars who you know are less seeming seemingly less supportive are just left alone to do their research and in this this manifests itself in ways from who comes to office hours, even who, who people will be willing to knock on their door to ask for directions in the department. You know, I, I have a, a senior male colleague just down the hallway and it's remarkable to me how often they, I get knocks on my door just to ask, you know, where to find that person. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure the opposite doesn't happen. So, um, so, so even the slightest kinds of, of expectations about who people are comfortable with, what, what ends up happening is that disproportionate labor gets concentrated in our Euroam scholars because those are the people to whom people go when when they need help so they're not they're not just left alone to do their research what do you think can be done about this if anything at least i mean acknowledging that there's this extra labor that they do is definitely a good start but i think wondering. that's why we're here right <laughs> is to start picking up some slack i mean that's really what we're geared towards as, as yale put so beautifully at the beginning of this of this session um, is to try to encourage one another to be more proactive in, in helping to in sort of smooth the distribution yeah. of that labor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think most people who are here are probably here because they're, they are interested in recruiting, supporting, and advancing their colleagues. Um, you know, so I, I do want to stress also that, that the second clause in this sentence, though, is that you have to proactively support the people who are there. So we can't recruit people to toxic labs and toxic departments only to allow them to flounder and not give them the proper support. So I think that getting to that the second part of the, um, the, the document is going to be imperative because that's really where, where our work lies, I think. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the Q&A regarding this. Uh, do you have any recommendations for advocating for these issues? If you're a junior member of a lab where the PI isn't proactive about them or doesn't think there are issues uh, there are issues within their lab. So certainly I think that this, uh, this has come up um, in some listservs on, on which I'm a part. There's, there's all sorts of uh, <laughs> hidden curricula at every stage of your career, whether it's in graduate school, as a postdoc, as a young faculty member. And so, for example, I've seen this question come up on listservs about how do you, how do you manage lab culture? And then you see pretty consistently replies like, what do you mean lab culture? And so I think the first step is that by default, PIs should find it, should take it on as a responsibility to be checking in with their lab, whether or not they think they, they have a problem. I mean, here, proactivity is really critical, right? We don't wanna be reactive. We don't wanna wait until problems boil over because if that's the case, then they've probably been there a long time. And one of our responsibilities as PIs is to foster an environment that is that in which everybody feels that they belong and are valued and respected. So I think even if there doesn't feel like there are problems, their job as PIs is to be there. There are templates for culture surveys, which um, we can dig up and share with all of you that other people have used and found totally illuminating. If it's not possible to allow people to answer anonymously because your lab group is sort of small and people would be identifiable, you know, there are other steps that we can try to, you know, I'd love, I'd love to hear if other people in the Q&A have managed this, how they've managed this challenge because I think it's incredibly important for us to be constantly soliciting feedback in addition to giving it to our lab members. Um, someone wrote, uh, related to the question now, it would be very helpful to have spe specified or maybe specific rules and tools to self-advocate as students. Students don't feel they have any tools, nor feel safe of repercussion for doing so, but often this is the most critical gap. So I wanted to say about this, and it's later in the document, but you know, we don't have to go by the order here. <laughs> um, there's an issue of accountability and who feels accountable to whom and um, assuming that most people who uh, commit aggressions towards people in their lab or towards students in their program or in their class, they do not in intend to do to so, they do not intend to hurt people, but they, and they, might have, they might be absolutely clueless and have no idea how badly they are hurting other people. 
The question is, how do we hold them accountable? How do students, students can't really call out their advisor or their professor in class and say, excuse me, professor, what you just said uh, sounded racist to me. That, that is not gonna work. Um, so what do they do? And we, we, we talked about this earlier, actually, the, the uh, uh, panelists, and, and it's, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a tough question. Um, one, be, okay, so the idea that we had was that um, departments can, and you can advocate for your department to put up a anonymous way to report these incidents, uh, because of course the kind of apprenticeship model in academia means that if it's not anonymous, uh, there might be retaliation, whether, um, intended or unintended. Uh, but if, if you report anonymously, and if, you know, if there's one report, then someone might think, you know, this is one, you know, very grumpy person. But if, if a bunch of people report at the same time, you know, this professor said this in class today, and it was really inappropriate, then um, hopefully the powers that be, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second, will, uh, will act on that. And now the question is, what can the powers that be do? And that's the other really tough part of this, because thinking of me as faculty, for instance, I have no, um, I have no way to hold other faculty accountable and they have no way to hold me accountable. We just don't have that in our system right now. And that's when we talk about systemic uh, things that we might want to change. There is a problem here that, no, that we're basically kind of independent agents. Um, so I think the, you know, you said that now you will be fired. That's not obviously gonna work, but of course that's not what we want either. What we want is, um, is constructive intervention. And so we were wondering aloud together when we were talking about this yesterday, uh, can departments or can we all push for departments or universities to have um, a role of someone who is a professional at, at giving this feedback to faculty, explaining to them in a way that they will hear rather than be defensive, um, what they're doing wrong, how they could do it better. Because again, the assumption is that people have good intentions. The problem is people also have very fragile emotions and egos. So, <laughs> so appealing to their good intentions without, uh, and it's not that we need to, white fragility is a real, real, real thing. And I'm not saying because they're fragile, we need to walk on tiptoes, but if we want it to be effective, since there's no actual formal way to you know, uh, punish them, the best we can do is be effective. And I, and, and I was wondering if there are people who, who know how to do that professionally, because I feel like you know, I don't know, my department chair uh, doesn't know, I, who would act best on these comments? So, so we have a couple, we have a lot of questions and comments here. Um, there's kind of, there's, uh, I just want to note, um, Jennifer Silvers had, had asked about um, how we can potentially incentivize people to, uh, or distribute the, the extra labor a little bit more equitably, you know, maybe teaching releases, giving trainees credit. So I just want to highlight that some departments have university uh, diversity fellows. So they act as liaisons to the, to the sort of school level diversity office, and those are paid positions. And so advocating for things of that nature, or if people are doing the work of being something like director of graduate studies, director of undergraduate studies, that that should come with course releases, because that tends to be the point person through whom these grievances come. If your department doesn't have these, so we're also getting questions about what happens if you go to another professor or you go to the TA and that person says just ignore it or keep it moving. I mean this is where it is that we need to have uh, these institutional roles where that person is, is sanctioned, that person is allowed to go and then talk to them. It's their job, it's their responsibility to say we've received a complaint about you and now we have to talk about this. And we don't want to solve the problem by just removing these people from their interactions with undergraduate and graduate students because basically what you're doing is just you're making, you're, you're disincentivizing um, participation because now they say, oh, now you're, you've reduced my teaching load, you've reduced my committee load, I have to do even fewer things for the department, I can focus even more on my research. So really I think a starting point is having um, an accountability officer, both at the graduate and undergraduate levels, and figuring out structures for sanctioning behavior when people cross those lines in a way that's actually costly for the people who've, who've misstepped. Ombudsperson, yes. Thank you, Laura Bustamante. Um, different universities are going to have different structures and different reporting structures, different roles. 
um, how is that not a microaggression? How is it not a microaggression to report somebody? I, I guess I'm not sure what the question, what the that in that question is. So I'm going to keep it moving. Um, um, I, I want to address here um, is what we're advocating basically uh, something like a Title IX office for gender, the one that's, that exists for mm -hmm. gender-based discrimination uh, and harassment, uh, but for uh, racial issues. And, and that's, a, that's a really good question. I mean, it would obviously, there, there are different, um, there are a lot of different details, right? Um, uh, sexual harassment is, and, and, and uh, sexual abuse, of course, is, is a crime, uh, whereas um, racist remarks are, uh, at this point, not, not a crime of that same status. But uh, we do, but I, th I think there's something similar there. I think maybe one of the big differences is that it seems like Title IX offices, often their job in some sense is also to protect the institution. And here, this is not an issue. Uh, the people who are committing these aggressions are very powerful. They are already protected in so many ways. Uh, what we want to do is to improve the institution, not protect it. And we want to improve the institution not because we want to be on the best university and, you know, I, I topped the list of uh, where is it uh, most comfortable for people to be in some like imaginary um, race. We want to improve our institutions because we want it to be comfortable for everybody and we want to um, have everybody who wants to do science be able to do science without um, without having to um, basically compromise on their emotional and and um, on their emotional well-being. There's an answer here that also helps a lot. Thank you, anonymous attendee. Basically, they said that I had I rotated through a PI's lab and he gave me resources and options for reporting things and who I could talk to if I was not comfortable speaking to him. So again, the onus is on the people in power to give those options to lay them bare to their trainees and say, hey, if I'm ever out of line and you don't feel like you can speak to me, here's a list of, here's, here, here are your actions for recourse. This is what it is that you can do. This is with whom you can speak. And if I, I should have an expectation of hearing from that person if ever I step out of line. I think that that's a great example. Um, we should, it, it should be on us to be able to give those resources. Someone said Title IX offices will address many of these issues as well. Um, I also want talk to about say fun someone, someone noted that, um, if there are very few uh, people of color or very few black people and they're comp complaining about, and there's an anonymous complaint, how will that not be attributed to them that they're complaining? And that's where we all, everybody, whether you're URM or not, we all have to be the, you know, see something, say something people and, and, and notice that's the bystander intervention, right? We, we should definitely not wait for the people who are aggressed against to complain. There's a good question here. How can a grad student or postdoc stand up when a PI is not on the same page, like even the power differential? Um, what do you guys think? <laughs> See, Maybe going to I a mean, different PI or like program? Well, even that this is growing up, in, growing up in science forum, that's where, you know, we always end up with those points about mentorship and the very, very difficult power imbalance that happens between a trainee and their mentor. Um, and there are not great answers there. Um, I think the anonymous why I've been focusing on how can we help that person, the PI, realize their mistakes and fix mm -hmm. them from their side because, it, yeah, it's, it's really tough. I mean, you could go, you, you can report it to another PI for sure or to DGS some folks person, et cetera. But what do you do about the broken trust mm -hmm. between you and your PI? And that is, that is tough. I think, um, should we know. continue in our document a little bit? Sure. Definitely. Um, We're more than halfway. Um, and we yes. wrote that timekeeping. Yes. So, um, I just wanted to point out here, there was a, a um, Undersighting black researchers and scientific papers. Nancy, did you want to? I, I just highlighted it because it's a simple thing. Like if you keep it in mind, like um, it's an extra step of like, hey, am I citing any black uh, uh, researchers that have done this work? So that's a very simple intervention that when we write papers and grants, we can make sure that we're uh, citing the black scholars that deserve the credit. 
I also just want to note that there's a resource for that. So Max Bertolero in uh, Danny Bassett's lab actually has some code for automatically checking your citation practices on uh, race and for name based on census data. And then you can compare that against the base rates of expected citation rates conditional on citing papers from 2016 on in neuroscience. So it's really specific to neuroscience for now, but um, that tool is already available on GitHub and we will share a, a link to a resource that includes a link to that tool as well as um, they don't yet have a preprint, but also the census uh, code that they use to, to, to be able to make them inferences of race. That sounds like a and wonderful you can, you tool. Can easily, you can easily check yourself. Yeah. And I also wanted to add to that another tool and kind of taking it one step earlier, not only your citations, are you reading uh, work by people of color and by black scholars? So there's a list that has been, there are several probably, but there's a list that's been curated recently and we can uh, include that link as well. And it's, it's a great list, uh, not only because it has the names of people and it has what they study. And I was looking at that list and found several people who study things that I'm very, very interested in that I did not know and did not know their work. So, um, you know, once you read people's work, you will cite it where appropriate uh, much more easily than, than as a, a check at the end of writing your paper. Let's see. I, um, I feel like we, there, are, there are several questions in a row about um, this power differential, and, and so it, it might be worth, and also PIs who, who seem to be actively um, opposed to bringing URM students because of some assumption about uh, they're compromising somehow on academic excellence. Um, and I think that that is a, um, I've certainly heard uh, people make that comment um, in, in the field, in my field, um, and I think that, so I, found an example of, um, on Twitter, Imogen Co actually shared a response that she uh, gives whenever someone says something like that. And what she says to people, so this is gonna be another, unfortunately, faculty to faculty interaction, but her response is, um, sorry, I'm just doing this search for it in the doc. Oh, um, here, bystander remarks, that's what you're looking for? No, um, she she says basically. Um, sorry, I'm looking in the in the concrete steps. Mm. Um, so when we have examples of, of people who who make uh, statements like this, she says things like, um, "Not only are we uh, when someone says I'm all for diversity as long as we ma we can maintain our high standards," she says, "Not only are we maintaining, we are raising our standards by acknowledging the myth of meritocracy and finding all the talent we've been missing this whole time." So um, that is in the doc too, if people want to have a canned response to commit to memory in case that conversation comes up again. Yes, we have this down here in this document as well at the department level, committing to hiring and retaining multiple faculty of color, also uh, students of color, uh, students and postdocs, the graduate student body. And um, I added here, um, I don't know, I you know, didn't have the chance to read everything in, in the Google form, so I bet other people wrote this as well, but I think it's really important to make clear to yourself and to everybody, uh, but, but importantly to yourself that you're not hiring people because they're people of color. Um, you are hiring them because they are great at what they, what they do, uh, but you're evaluating their potential for success while taking into account the disadvantages they have had to face. So maybe they had fewer opportunities, maybe they came from a college that didn't have uh, they didn't have research opportunities. They didn't have the mentors who would write, uh, you know, mentors from Princeton or Harvard who would write uh, letters for them. Uh, that does not mean they don't have scientific potential, right? So it's, it's evaluated, it's not lower. People feel that by default, uh, as we are, um, if, you know, if we are to change the makeup of our programs, then we are lowering a bar. And the, the point is we're actually making the bar higher because the bar is now lower for the people who just have an easy cruise through and do not have to, um, do not have to, have to overcome these adversities and disadvantages. The people who overcame them are better. <laughs> They're not worse. But it's, it's, it goes back to that first point in the very beginning of telling people you got in just because you're Black. This, this, we, we really have to root that out of our thinking because it's the exact opposite. Yeah, um, so, so we talked a little bit about structural changes. 
um, in terms of, you know, the kinds of different roles and departments that might be implemented. I think uh, other structural changes that have come up in the questions and that we should also discuss is um, the kinds of expectations that we have for how much people are able to fund themselves, both through summer programs, so the amount of recruiting that happens for volunteer-based research assistance over the summer, and then who disproportionately gets uh, who's, a, who's able to afford to participate in those programs and then gets more experience and puts that on their vita and has another letter of recommendation versus people who have to uh, do paid internships. And then, and, and then I saw another question also about relating to um, moving costs, Yael, I think you've brought that up before, and also costs related yeah. to conferences, how we have a, you pay out of pocket then reimburse and how costly that is, especially if you start to account for things like interest accruing and how many months it takes for people to get reimbursed in some departments. Um, and a lot of that, I think, you know, I think that people can advocate. So, so just getting back to the question of, of how do we graduate students and, and postdocs together, if you have a union, for example, I would try to leverage that. If you do not have a union, you can still collectively try to bargain with your departmental chair by bringing this up. Many of them may not even know that these are issues for you. Um, and you can try to also lobby the uh, faculty senate as well as broader administration within your school to make this uh, possible. But given that conferences are such a core component of our training and, and how it is that we build out our networks and also promote our science. And um, I think that, that it's very, we can make an argument for how critical it is that, that that be leveled, that it's not restricted to the people who can afford to pay for these things out of pocket. Uh, many PI I will spend them. I want to say on this is sometimes it's a way easier fix than you think. It's just nobody thought of this. So for instance, when we invite people to interview uh, for their graduate interviews, some people might be invited to several uh, schools and they have to pay upfront the cost of the flights to all of these schools. Yes, they get reimbursed, but that's thousands of dollars that they have to pay for the privilege of being interviewed. They, they had, you know, they, we are promising them nothing at that point. And it turns out that it's really easy for instance, in my department, for us to just buy the ticket for them. Just nobody thought of that to start with. And so, um, you, uh, or for instance, applying to graduate school costs X dollars, like, you know, $100 per institution or something like that. It's really easy to get that waived, but that was not made public in any way. And it's as much as, you know, putting, uh, uh, lobbying your university to put on their admissions website, here's how you get a waiver. I, you just email this person. Um, because these resources exist, it, 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 I don't know if at all universities, for sure not at all universities, but some universities, exi they exist and they're just hidden and, and nobody takes advantage of them. And to the point yeah, of- maybe view, once yeah. they're invited, like explicitly saying like, you could either, we could buy these things for you or you could choose to get reimbursed because it's a burden, like, I think many people feel afraid to even ask. I'm exactly. find out like I don't have a credit card or my credit card limit is five hundred dollars. Like, how am I going to buy this? Exactly. And and the institutional policies for paying research assistance. Uh, that's again that's something that has changed in my university in the last few years. We used to be able to uh, we used to have uh, volunteers and non volunteers. We are not allowed to take volunteers anymore. And I think as an institutional policy, at first I thought oh, but that's, you know, denying, you know, if I can only pay for three people, but I would have otherwise mentored eight people, that's denying five people opportunity. But it happens to be that that's denying opportunity selectively uh, from people who wouldn't, you know, for some people it, it, that if, if we did, if we had these volunteer positions, their opportunity would be denied anyway. So I think that I've, I've come actually pretty quickly to think that this is a really good policy. But I wanted to add to this that now we've learned, thank you, COVID, uh, that we can do a lot of things online and for free. We can do a lot of mentorship and a lot of training um, online. We've been thinking about this in my lab. We have some training events that we do for our interns and suddenly we thought, wait, do we have to limit it to our interns in our lab? Uh, so, so I admit that this is you know, people who join in on these events, that is volunteer work because we're not paying them for their time but at least they don't have to travel anywhere and they can choose how much time they want to put in it. And they're basically getting some mentoring and training um, for free where normally students have to pay a lot for getting access to training and mentoring. So it's kind of between paying them for their work, but it's, it's um, I think it's, it's uh, a half step that, that um, together with anybody who works for our labs should be paid. 
period. So um, I want to point out that the NIH has some training grants that are specific for programs that will pay underrepresented minority undergrads. I think that all of the underrepresented minority uh, PIs that I know today or, or postdocs were part of these programs. I was part of these programs myself. Um, so some institutions have them and you can reach out and make sure that to support these programs, like take mentees from their, um, when they, you know, when they send out an email, it's like, oh, we're looking for volunteers to take people into their lap, like support these programs because they, they are a very important tool for getting, um, especially black and underrepresented minorities into research because otherwise you cannot really afford to volunteer in a lab. NSF has a similar program through their REU supplement. You can basically tack it on to your main grant application. And um, in the link that we're gonna share with you at the end of this, there's also, I, I just cut and paste my own supplement paragraph. So you can just copy it and, and add it to your next grant and you can apply for it. And then you get funding for students um, that you can bring in either on your own, but many of your universities, you should check into this, have, for example, existing summer research opportunities. Um, one that I've worked with extensively is the Leadership Alliance that has satellite programs across a wide variety of campuses. Um, and basically, you know, there's already, everything's built in. You don't even have to help in terms of finding housing. That's all part of the program. There's even, um, you can add more funding if you wanna provide GRE training. Um, you can, I mean, they have a community built in because it's usually spread across many different labs within the university. So it's not just you trying to give these students structure. They have a broader community outside of your lab. Um, we, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that you just highlighted the GRE thing. And also someone earlier yeah. made the point GRE that we should- training is important, getting rid of the GRE even better. <laughs> yeah, well, right. So, um, so, so, I mean, this, this, there's, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on that topic. And so I, I can't speak to that, but I saw another thing that we can do is we can, most departments have lots of um, opportunities for, for graduate school application waiver, fee waivers. Most people don't know to ask on most, if your department doesn't have that loud and clear at the top of their page where the application is linked, please, please, please encourage them to do that because it's a very easy fix and it will increase um, the number of applicants that you have because that is, they, those are prohibitively costly and add up very quickly. I wanted to uh, especially note this point um, that uh, someone contributed uh, in the Google form. So having departmental town halls around the topic of racism and, and injustice along with actionable item in an effort to bridge the gap between academics isolating themselves from issues occurring on campus or on a broader scale. And that relates to a point that we had uh, before but didn't really mention verbally, which is the idea that these problems don't happen in my department or don't happen in my university. They're other people's problems. Uh, I think we can safely say they happen everywhere. Um, if you haven't noticed them yet around you, it's because you haven't looked very closely um, or because they're not, uh, you're not in the afflicted group and they have not been, uh, you know, these problems have not uh, been in your face for, for a whole many reasons and that is part of the issue. Uh, so scheduling, I, I, I mark this because I thought it's a good idea to schedule, especially, you know, now there's this uh, moment of tragic death and kind of wonderful rising of uh, people's energy and motivation to solve and to change. But we can't, we can't pretend that this will happen in a week or in a month. Uh, these are problems, systemic racism in the United States, especially and, and racism against black people has been around for, you know, since the inception of this country. Uh, so it's going to continue for a while uh, and we will have a lot of work um, set up. So this idea of scheduling every six months, every one year, a check-in at the departmental level, um, I thought that was a great point. And then uh, this person also mentioned on the last point, during both COVID and the recent horrendous murders, graduate students around me have been shocked, but also stressed about getting their work done. This includes me. In times like this, promoting the value and creating a culture of being an active member of community over a productive academic uh, culture would be invaluable for everyone. So I just wanted to acknowledge how hard it is for everybody at this point, especially for people of color with all these pressures and stressors and emotional
fatigue. Um, I, I've heard from people that every day they just they drop from fatigue from dealing uh, with all of this. And on in the background there is, and why aren't you producing science? Uh, so indeed, um, it is exceptionally hard. And um, and this is a time where maybe you know, especially with COVID too, maybe maybe producing science is not the most important thing that we can do right now. I'm not saying, you know, let's shut down everything completely, but you know, if, if you go to a, a much lower gear on your science, that is fine. And also I think that as scientists, we have a responsibility, we have a strong responsibility to do this work and to see where it intersects with our science, to see where it intersects with the systems of power that we are part of as academics, the money that we are stewards of as um, people who have federal grants, we basically have tax money in our hands that we decide how it is used. And that is part of wealth redistribution and, and, and where we invest our time is, is something that we should take very responsibly. And I think hatching the next neuron can wait a little bit, especially at this moment. Um, we have a vote for eliminating uh graduate uh, app uh, fees, and I'm all for it. <laughs> I don't even know what yeah. that money goes towards, actually. <laughs> and as, and I, by the way, that's one of the reasons that I uh, am so against the GRE. For many reasons, I'm against the GREs, but one of them is it costs money to get your GRE results sent to each institution. You have to pay for each institution separately, and that's just an unnecessary tax, absolutely unnecessary tax. I was wondering if I could just jump in because um, I think it's great that we are uh, talking about how to make admissions to graduate school more equitable. Um, but I think we all know that Black and URM students entering STEM, especially, face systemic injustices every step along the way. So I think we can also do a lot um, much earlier in, in the pipeline. And I'm, I'm particularly thinking of outreach because that's easy to do and many people already do it. Uh, like you can help change the messaging, right? You you can help change the messaging that Black and URM students uh, sometimes receive, like that they're aiming too high or that they're not good enough, or maybe they just never get told about how how a STEM career path could work, right? So you could th there are many organizations that already do outreach, old-fashioned uh, school visits to high schools. There's Skype a scientist. There's initiatives by professional organizations, and uh, like one one thing that I'm personally committed to doing having already done some outreach in the past is doing this in a much more targeted way that I wouldn't go to the privileged schools, but I would try to connect to um, the schools that have uh, more black and URM students and, and try to um, stem the leaks in the pipeline much earlier. I'm also wondering Spark as you're society saying that is a resource. Yes. Sorry, Spark Society is a resource that is putting together, um, basically you can, just to talk about gaps in mentorship, um, and, and I mean, this is so broad. If you're not at an R1, uh, you know, university institution, even if you're at a small liberal arts school, you don't get access to a lot of that hidden curriculum, even as an undergraduate. And so um, Spark Society is basically providing an opportunity for people to get feedback, whether it's on their research statements, whether it's on their grants, if you're a little bit further along in your career, um, and matching you with people to help act as um, mentors, informal mentors, but mentors nevertheless, in order to give you early feedback on all of these different documents. Because I think a lot of us have seen, you know, for example, the misguided application where a student didn't realize that when you say personal statement, really what we mean is like the narrative of your research experience, but then you get a very personal statement. And that wouldn't have been what they had written if we had just called it something different. Um, and so they just didn't have anybody to tell them that it's going to, you know, that our expectations are X, Y, Z. I think that, that, that all, of, all of that hidden curriculum becoming much more explicit earlier on in, in students' careers is going to make a big difference. I think, um, yes, that there are some very easy fixes there as well, like um, uh, students mentioning faculty in their application really helps because then those faculty go and look at their application, but some students don't know that they should be mentioning people by name. So we've now added to our forums, just, you know, you have to mention three names uh, because it just seems like that's, that's such an easy fix to, to ask for directly. But with respect to the, the naming of things like personal statement, I never thought of that. What a terrible title for it. Um, 
I was thinking when Weiji was talking about our outreach, I wonder if we should uh, be thinking about it a little bit like advertising uh, where they do focus groups and check the messaging because it's easy to mess that up. There are code words that we might not know that basically say that they signal to people, this is not for you. And I know this from the point of view of being a woman in science, that there are some things I just read them and I immediately know this is not for me. I'm not even sure what word says it, but I immediately know that. And I don't brilliant. think the people who wrote that meant to, yes, brilliance is one of them. Yes, we're looking only for very excellent people with amazing math skills. You know, I'm not saying my math skills are not amazing, but I read that and I'm like, that's not for me. Uh, and so in the same way, we might be totally blundering our messaging and going to, um, and even when we're going with all the outreach to the right schools and everything, we might be signaling to them, yes, here's the white person coming to tell you that they're, they've, you know, checked the checkbox on their outreach, but they're not really pulling you in. And, and I don't know. I don't know if I make that mistake. I don't know if we make that mistake as a department, as a, as a university. I'm thinking um, there's probably stuff written on this and there's, and there's an ability to just do a focus group, to just ask some people, would this be welcoming to you? Um, or, or would this not? And, 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 and try different messages until we get it right. And, and I think this is really interesting in terms of what someone wrote here, uh, getting institutions to hold each other accountable for making actionable changes like a Paris Climate Agreement collaboration between institutions. I'm thinking about this, you know, if we learned how to get our messaging right, we shouldn't just keep it to ourselves. Like universities should join on this. This is a joint effort. We're not, we're not doing this, um, again, like there's this constant competition in science. Each university wants to do, uh, do other universities, but that's just a mistake that we do not share resources here um, because it just slows, it slows the progress of, of making this better, I think. So an idea that I love this idea of having some agreement between institutions that say, we're gonna work on this together and share what worked. Let's talk a little bit about the individual level. Well, I highlighted these first two because I really like them and I think they're, you know, relatively accessible but impactful things, especially like if you're teaching, making sure that you're highlighting the work of your M's when you're talking about, I mean, if it's neuroscience, like um, do that extra work such that you're changing the representation and it's a messaging that your students are getting. And then for a PI, uh, this requires your PI, of course, to like um, um, be in the same page. But if, if a lab together could create a manual where you explicitly address what anti-racist conducts are versus racist, like to just like sometimes people need it to be spelled out and that can help. I want to say in terms of including in the syllabus, um, some people will say, well, in my small field, unfortunately, there are no black scholars who work in that specific um, question. First of all, check twice because maybe there are, but apart from that, look at first authors as well. And when we're putting up, you know, in our slide, a picture like a, the face of the person who did the work so that people can personify it and, and, and feel that they, they, you know, they have a face to the name, you can put a picture of the first author too. You can put a picture of the postdoc that worked on that. They are going to be uh, the, the PIs of tomorrow. Um, and even if they aren't, it doesn't matter. It is their work. Um, and, and I think it, it is unfortunately very true that the, the pipeline has been especially thin at the top. And it's hard to find, you know, academia was actually closed. People don't know this, that universities were closed to black people, to women, to non-Christians until uh, not that long ago. So when you're looking at, you know, where are the 80 year olds uh, professors uh, that are black, you might not find any because maybe they just, that was not an option for them at all. Uh, so, but we can highlight from the bottom, we can highlight the, the, the graduate student who did the work. Well, um, I also just want to note for anyone, I know a lot of us have other town halls and lab meetings and things. It is two o'clock. Um, mm -hmm. 
but I think um, I'm happy to stay on for a little while longer if there are other, I mean, there. Are, I hope that everybody can see these so Q, Q and A's. There's so many questions and a lot of really great resources. Um, Lauren Atlas also just highlighted the fact that, you know, when we talk about careers in STEM uh, to high school students, we often fail to mention that you get paid to go to graduate school if you're pursuing a PhD. It's not that you're accruing massive debt the way you might if you were going, say, to law school or other professional schools. So just getting, you cannot see the Q&A. God. I know, so uh, I, I knew that people cannot see q and but we can post these in the document after, afterwards. Okay, okay, yeah. So we'll collate all these questions and uh, responses and put them together also with a doc. Um, and also we'll share a link to uh, the doc that a few colleagues have put together to try and collate concrete steps that people can take to recruit, support, and advance uh, underrepresented minor minoritized scholars in our departments and field. Uh, Lauren sees a Q and A though. Okay, I don't know. Whatever. Okay, so, um, but in any case, we'll put it all together, right, um, and share it as widely as possible. So, other points here. Every time you're asked to propose reviewers, speakers, etc., uh, diversify the list that you're proposing. Um, if you're allowed to only propose one person at a time, like in, in, some, in some places you can propose more than one, so propose several uh, and include their people of color. Um, if you're allowed only to, um, to nominate one person, then it might happen that the person on top of your list right now is not a person of color, but then next time are they not a person of color as well? And next time and next time. So one way to do this is make a list for yourself, all the people that you want to nominate, including people of color, and go through that list. So every year when we nominate for our seminar series, if I nominate only one person, I am eventually going through this list. So kind of ensuring diversity in my list uh, over time. Same when you're proposing reviewers for your papers. Are we always proposing the same people that come to mind, but they are not a diverse representation of the field. And I realize that um, reviewing a paper, of course, is work and putting work uh, uh, and asking someone to do unpaid work, of course, but it's also part of being kind of in the behind the scenes in the field, setting the agenda, uh, being, the, being one of the people who gets to say, you know, what is the standard for publishing in my field? So it's a very powerful position uh, to be in. And, uh, there's no excuse to limit that, limiting that to very few people. If you're an editor of a journal, of course, uh, you can prioritize papers that actively examine issues of racial or ethnic uh, health equity and, are, and prioritize papers that are written on anything by Black, Indigenous, and, and people of color. Yeah, cite your colleagues, uh, invite your colleagues to panels at conferences, um, ask your colleagues to be your your URM colleagues to be co PIs on your grants. Um, you know, tap into their expertise, bring them bring them into your projects, um, and and you have to support the colleagues you have there. We're not going to age out of this problem because our pipeline is leaky, and our colleagues, uh, our URM colleagues, will leave before they get to ch a chance to occupy leadership roles. So this has to be a very proactive effort from everybody who's overrepresented. And students and postdocs, I feel like we're talking so much here to PIs, but a lot of the people listening in are students and postdocs. Uh, first of all, you read the literature all the time, actually more than the PIs. So make sure you read a, a varied and diverse uh, literature in your field. Um, other issues that came up here is thinking about how your, act your own research and somewhere in the document, um, how your own research relates to, uh, to issues of health equity, to issues of, uh, we were just talking this morning in my lab about how um, um, mass incarceration and, 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 and fear that goes into the uh, uh, system of, of mass incarceration and, and the, whole, the whole movement of, uh, to abolish uh, uh, prison, prison abolition might relate to how our memory is susceptible to sensational things. So, you know, so we study memory and learning, so we can think about that. So for every topic, you might uh, find a relationship to an issue that is societally important and science is important, and so, or societally important science is important. Um, and one more thing that I wanted to say for students, 
and postdocs, um, I know you have a lot of conversations about these things. Um, and conversations about what we, the faculty, are doing wrong. Don't keep that to yourself. And that, that goes back to, you know, can we have anonymous ways to report, to, to report or, or have that conversation with faculty? Because if you keep that to yourself, we cannot know what to fix. And I know it's not on you to educate us and to tell us what to fix, but the practical side of it is that you're already spending time and effort on this and, and documenting for yourself what it is. If there's a lobby or university, your, your department to have a way for you to, to make that work available to the people who actually, uh, who actually did the wrong and should fix it. Maybe you should start wrapping up. Uh, so we wanted to make, uh, to uh, send everybody, or not send, but to uh, highlight the Google Doc, um, Mina, that you were talking about before. It's a tiny URL, um, practical steps. Is that what it's called? Concrete steps. Yeah, tinyurl.com slash concrete steps. It has a, a, a lovingly curated list <laughs> of, uh, of ideas from many other people about what about concrete steps that people could take at different levels. And um, Mina, do you have, is there a way for people to submit more ideas into that or you can email me there are a couple of people who consented to put their emails at the top you can email me or any of the other folks who put their emails there and um, we can either share it with you to add your suggestions or we'll add them ourselves if that's not something that you have time for another thing i want to do is give a shout out also to um, academics for black lives they have a whole series of goals and objectives that i think um, that people who are in this panel would also be interested in perusing so um, check out academics for the number four BSW on Twitter or the hashtag academics for black lives. I also um, want to add that um, both uh, Mina's document and the document that we're currently looking at will be posted on the Growing Up in Science website. You just want to, a one stop, a single stop to get all the resources. And I wanted to say that this is not a one-off event for Growing Up in Science. So uh, there is already at least one more event that's being planned. We don't have a date yet to share with you, but there are going to be other events that will not be in a, of this format, uh, but uh, will be uh, focused on this same topic. Waiji, do you want to say more? Yeah, so especially for those of you who were not here in the very beginning when Yael introduced uh, the, the, the setup here, we are very well aware that uh, we are not part of uh, the most affected groups. We are not uh, uh, black uh, URM ourselves. And we, we realize that it's incredibly important to hear from uh, black URM scientist activists who, who are leaders in addressing these issues and who have a uh, long track record of anti-racism. So uh, future events are going to be uh, focused on uh, uh, listening to them. Uh, time was just too short to uh, get that in place uh, for this particular day. Thank you everybody for joining and for the work that you did and for the work that you will do in the future and for the um, ongoing mindset um, that, that we have to stay in um, to really check ourselves. I think the last thing here on the document was set aside time to make sure I'm listening, reading, staying informed, doing also. Uh, actively doing, set aside time to check in with yourself uh, once an X time to ask, am, am, I, am I still keeping this on top of my mind? Uh, what am I doing now about this? Um, because uh, exactly as Mina said, we're not just going to age out of this, you know, just not doing harm is not enough. We need to do, we need to um, proactively seek to, to heal and um, yeah, silence is violence, <laughs> as uh, people wrote on Twitter. I'm copying others. I uh, did not make that up. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.